God, rain down your Holy Spirit on us now that your word can be preached and heard and that we can become the people and the church you desire us to be. We thank you for your word and for its inherent power and pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So on the topic of sermons, you've got short sermons, like the one a pastor preached on 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, love is patient, love is kind. He read the scripture, paused, took a deep breath, and said, love, and sat down to the applause of the congregation. You've got long sermons, like the time a pastor back in New England in colonial times was going on and on. They, they, they preached for hours back then. Now, the ushers were armed with long sticks to poke anyone who nodded off during these marathon sermons. One man, though, fell sound asleep. The pastor spotted him, kept on preaching, and nodded to the usher, who went over and poked him with a long stick. Man didn't wake up. Pastor nodded again. So the usher cracked the man over the head with a stick. The man fell over in his pew, opened one eye, and said, Hit me again, I can still hear him. <laughs> You've got effective sermons like Jonah's sermon in Nineveh. Repent, or in 40 days Nineveh will be destroyed. And the whole city did the ashes and sackcloth thing. And then you have hard sermons, tough sermons, like Jonathan Edwards' Sinners in the hands of an angry God, which had congregation after congregation wailing and weeping. And like Jeremiah's sermon we read a few moments ago. Jeremiah has been called the weeping prophet, because, both because of the hard, tough sermons he preached and because of his great grief over the content of his sermons the coming destruction of Jerusalem and Judah because of the people's disobedience to God. But unlike some preachers who gleefully preach hellfire and brimstone, Jeremiah stood with the people. He grieved for the people who heard his message. And one day, according to our reading, God tells Jeremiah to stand by the front entrance of the temple in Jerusalem. Now, the temple was the visible sign of God's presence with the people of Israel. It was where the people went to worship. It contained the Ark of the Covenant with the two tablets of the law. It had a small army of priests and assistants running the place. And there would have been lots of people coming to and fro. It was the structure that served as the national symbol for Judah. It was like the White House and the Capitol and the Washington Monument and the Lincoln Memorial all rolled into one. So Jeremiah fills his lungs and begins to bellow out his sermon in that most public place, in that most religious place. And it's a hard message, a shocking message. Speaking the word of the Lord, he says, Amend your ways. Stop oppressing the weak among you, the weak, the, the, the widow, the orphan, the alien among you. Stop chasing after those small g gods who are not gods at all. Treat the poor and the weak with justice. Or else, or else I will cast you out of my sight. And this temple in which you trust will be destroyed. I don't think anyone stayed for the coffee hour after that service. Why did God give Jeremiah that particular sermon to preach? Martin Luther King once said, The arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And that is because God is active in the world, on the side of the poor, the weak, and the downtrodden. God hears the cries of suffering people. God's heart is moved by their pain. God is outraged by injustice. And when his people suffer, God acts. Abraham Lincoln, 
saw and articulated this during the Civil War. In March 1865, the war was only weeks away from Lee's surrender at Appomattox. The Union had won. And during March 1865, Lincoln gave his second inaugural address. And instead of crowing over the almost defeated South and condemning the South for fighting to preserve slavery, Lincoln said both North and South suffered the catastrophe of the war because of the judgment of God for the evil of slavery. He said, fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondsmen's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with a sword. As was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. The arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Why is this? One of the most amazing claims of the Bible is that we little human beings can know God. And that's entirely because God reveals God's self to us. God tells us who he is, what he is like. In our reading, God does just this, says through Jeremiah, thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices loving kindness, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, says the Lord. To know God means in part to know what God practices, what God does, loving kindness, justice, and righteousness. Now let's spend a few minutes here. Let's start with that word righteousness. God does righteousness, the Lord says to the prophet. What's that mean? Well, it means that God makes right what isn't right. Like for us, we're not right because we're broken and sinful people who've turned away from God, made a mess of our lives and a mess of God's good world. We're not right, and because of that, the world isn't right. But God takes what isn't right and makes it right again. So God came to us in Christ, and Christ died for us to break the power of sin and death, to forgive our sin and lead us back to God. In Christ, God comes to those who aren't right and makes us right again. And that's good news. But God doesn't stop there. God sees everything that isn't right, and his will is to make it right. Especially, the Bible tells us over and over again, the suffering of poor, sick, captive, oppressed human beings. If you say you know God, you've got to know this. A lot of us Christians in the Western world don't seem to, though. We focus so much on God making us right with him through the cross of Christ so we get to go to heaven that we miss that God's heart is grieved by the suffering of the poor, weak, and oppressed and that God wants to make it right what isn't right in the world that is keeping people down. Like from Exodus, the word says God heard the cries of his people enslaved in Egypt, suffering under the lash. God said, that isn't right. And God sent Moses to tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. For almost 300 years, supposedly Christian Europe packed Africans into sailing ships and brought them to slavery in the New World. Over 12 million Africans were sold to Europeans by their fellow Africans or seized by European soldiers. Tens of thousands died on the Middle Passage from disease, from starvation. Some threw themselves overboard and drowned rather than face a lifetime of bondage. Hundreds of thousands died working the sugarcane fields of the Caribbean so Europeans and Americans could have sugar in their tea and coffee. God said, 
that isn't right, and raised up William Wilberforce to lead a decades-long fight against the slave trade, a fight that broke his health. And finally, in 1807, the British Parliament outlawed it. In 1917, the Communist Party came to power in Russia, and the Soviet Union grew, and communists killed tens of millions of people, and then after World War II, occupied and oppressed the peoples of Eastern Europe. God said, that isn't right, and God raised up Lech Walesa to lead solidarity in communist Poland, and the Soviet grip began to weaken, and then it all crashed down in 1989, when the Berlin Wall fell. Moses, Lech Walesa, William Wilberforce, great people whom God raised up to confront great injustices. But remember now our reading. God was calling every single Israelite to do what's right. Don't cheat people. Take care of the poor and the weak and the suffering. And make your nation a light to the world by how you live in the everyday. And when you see something that isn't right, do something to make it right. We Christians believe that we know God, we understand God most clearly through Jesus Christ. There's a great prophecy in the Old Testament that promises that when the Messiah comes, all people will be able to know God. And that's because Jesus is God in the flesh, a human being joined to the life of God himself. The way to know God is to know God's Son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ cared about making right what isn't right. It's all through his life and ministry. It was right there in the beginning of his ministry. In Luke chapter 4, when Jesus preaches one of his first sermons in his hometown synagogue, the Lord chooses a scripture from Isaiah that reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to pro proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he finishes reading, puts down the scroll, and gives one of those short sermons. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus Christ makes us right with God, but then calls us to follow him and work to make right what isn't right, to care about the people he cares about. The word gospel means good news, right? But a gospel that is good news for you and me, but not good news for the poor, suffering, and hurting, is no gospel at all. As Bishop Romero said, the person that is converted to Christ is the new human being that society needs to organize a world that is according to God's heart. Problem is, there are so many things that aren't right, it gets overwhelming. Tempting to shut it out because you feel like you're drowning. Problems are so big, what can you and I do about them? But that's not an option if you're going to follow Jesus Christ. I'm reminded of a story told by Brian Kirkland, who used to be pastor of Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church up in New York City. He rode the train into the church office every morning and sat in the same car with some of the same people. And he noticed that when the train went by one particularly bad neighborhood, one of the men riding the train would always pull down the shade. Kirkland asked the man why he would do that. The man said, I grew up in that neighborhood. It was terrible. We were poor, lived in a tiny apartment. There were roaches and rats, street gangs. It's still terrible. Now that I've made it out of there, left that behind, I don't like to be reminded. So I pull the shade down when we go by. Bryant Kirkland thought about this for a minute and said, the least you could do is leave the shade up. First thing we have to do is pay attention and notice what isn't right. And then ask God what God wants us to do about it. The United Nations estimates that 
43 million people have been driven from their homes by war, famine, economic despair, and are refugees. In 2016, our missions team pulled together representatives from some Franklin County churches to see if we could resettle refugee families here like was done after the Vietnam War. Politics slammed that door shut for a while, but when it opened again, the missions team restarted its effort, linked up with Church World Service and Refugee Resettlement Agency, so Central could sponsor a family. We started out planning for an Afghan family, but they were being resettled in other communities, and CWS asked if we would work with a Syrian family of eight who had spent the last 10 years in a refugee camp in Lebanon. And we did, and it has been a lot of hard work. But the Al Ali family is doing well, and we're preparing to welcome a second family in the not too distant future. By the way, we need a couple of people to help one of the Al Ali family learn how to drive. Please see me if you can help. This is sort of like the old joke how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. There's no end to the stuff that isn't right. But as God's kingdom expands, you take a bite here, a bite there, people are helped, suffering is relieved, things get better. You make a difference, and like the hymn goes, with deeds of love and mercy, God's heavenly kingdom comes. But there's something else going on in our community that I think grieves the heart of God. The number of homeless people in Franklin County. This will blow your mind. At the end of the last school year, there were about 250 students in the Chambersburg Area School District who were homeless. In shelters, living in cars, living in motels, living temporarily with somebody who made space for the family. And then there are other women and men in our community who are homeless. The reasons for this are complex including a severe shortage of affordable housing. And there is a lot of charitable help in Franklin County, but much more could be done. So on our summer mission trip, we saw how in Wilmington, churches, helping agencies, and the government are working together to help people move from homelessness to housing. It was inspiring to see. That experience has led some of us to dip our toes in the water, so to speak, by just beginning to pull together churches and helping agencies to talk about how we can work together, work with the government to help the homeless. As this develops, you will hear more, but for now, pray. Pray that God leads. Pray that God empowers us. So, sermons. Good sermons, bad sermons, effective sermons, hard sermons, also upsetting sermons. I preached one of those in my previous church. It was one line in the sermon that upset people the most when I said, nowhere in the Bible does it say God helps those who help themselves. Some people were taken aback, concerned, worried, like their whole understanding of life was built on the idea that God does help those who help themselves. And I had messed with their world. It's like Chuck Colson once said, when I first became a Christian, I took the Bible, and as a lawyer, I decided to see if it were true. I read this book from cover to cover three times. I was looking for that one verse of Scripture, the only verse I could quote from memory, God helps those who help themselves. I went through three times. I tried two translations. Amazingly, I couldn't find it. As a matter of fact, I found exactly the reverse. Is it not that what it means to know me, declares the Lord, to do justice and righteousness, to, please the, to plead the cause of the afflicted and needy? That is indeed what it means to know God. As followers of Jesus Christ, may we be channels for the love, the mercy, the compassion of God to our neighbors, our community, and to the world. Amen.